Oh, there you are. All right, so let's go back to Ohm's Law and get to the question about when does Ohm's Law fail? I mentioned it earlier in a previous recording. I said that uh, Ohm's Law fails when the resistance is not constant. Okay? And I hinted as to when that might happen. Uh, the most, there's lots of times that it can happen, but the most uh, common situation where R is not constant is uh, when the temperature of the circuit, the temperature of the wire or the temperature of the circuit path changes. Okay? Uh, it turns out uh, that uh, <clears throat> if the circuit starts to get hot, hotter, 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 really hot, that the resistance tends to increase. The reasons why that's true are fairly complicated. A simple but not completely accurate uh, model is essentially, and this is something we'll study in more detail later when we talk about uh, thermo, thermo, uh, thermodynamics, heat transfers, and things like that. <clears throat> um, essentially, when an object like a wire gets hotter, the, the result turns out to be that the atoms that make up the, in this case, the wire, the atoms start to vibrate. They start to move faster and faster and faster. And for complicated reasons, that simply makes it more difficult for charges to jump from atom to atom to atom. So that increases, and that, of course, is a, just another way of saying the resistance to flow of charge uh, increases. So if the resistance to flow increases, the amount of current that you get actually, of course, decreases. So the, the hotter the temperature of the wire is, uh, the, um, the greater the resistance tends to be. And conversely, if you, uh, if you decrease the temperature of the wire, wire somehow, if you cool it down a lot, the resistance uh, will also decrease with it. Now, <clears throat> these effects are not dramatic uh, for just a few degrees. So if you're at, at room temperature and you get from, you know, uh, <clears throat> from about 20 degrees uh, Celsius, of course, 20 degrees to 25 degrees or something, you will not, for almost all materials, you won't notice any significant change in, in the resistance. It's only when your circuits uh, start to get up into the hundreds of degrees, 100, 200, 300 degrees, uh, that the resistance really goes up. In fact, 300 degrees is still way hot. So once you get like 100, 120, 150 degrees, the temp, the, the resistance, sorry, really starts to increase, and so you have a big effect. Uh, also, you don't really notice a decrease in the resistance until you've cooled the thing down to uh, um, 50 degrees below zero, 100 degrees below zero. That's when the resistance really starts to drop. And then in the extreme, there's something called superconductivity, uh, where the resistant, where you cool something down, you cool the wire, you cool the, cool the circuit down enough that the uh, resistance actually and literally goes to zero, exactly zero. And this is a purely quantum mechanical effect, so I'm not going to even come close to discussing it uh, with you in this class. We can do it some other class in the future, I hope. But in any case. Um, those are, of course, very, very uh, extremes. You heat the wire up enough, eventually the thing will melt. If you cool it far enough, most um, conducting materials will become superconducting at very, very low temperatures. We're not going to be discussing those extremes, except I do want to uh, touch on the question now, why would the temperature of a circuit ever go up anyway? I mean, you're, what, are you turning on the heat in the room? No, not exactly. Okay. Uh, our depending on temperature. Again, why would the temperature ever increase? Where does that come from? How, would it, how does that, uh, what does that have to do with resistance? Well, um, temperature, uh, again, we'll be discussing this uh, in, uh, at another time, but temperature is essentially a measure of how much heat energy you have in your, in this case, in your wire or in your circuit, okay? Uh, oh, it's a measure of energy. Now, it's not a measure of kinetic energy. It's not a measure of potential energy. It's a measure of a, a third kind of energy, so-called so thermal energy. Uh, again, details in, uh, when we study thermodynamics. But for now, suffice to say that, the that in order to increase the temperature of something, you have to add energy to it. You add a third, this, you add this so-called thermal energy to it, okay? So, but 
like all energies, thermal energy uh, is uh, part of conservation of energy. So now we have kinetic energy, we have potential energy, and now thermal energy. And it's another one of the energies that you use in conservation of energy. So if you added thermal energy to the system, that energy didn't just appear. It had to come from somewhere. Where does it come from? Well, uh, again, very crude and not perfect model, but here's essentially the idea. So suppose I have a wire, which I have magnified uh, for ease of viewing. And uh, I have these my mobile charge carriers trying to make their way through the wire. Okay. And generally they're trying to go this way because there's an electric field that goes from this side to this side. Okay. And that that electric field has associated with it the electric potential difference, which, by the way, from this point forward, I'm going to kind of play fast and loose with the, di the distinction between EMF uh, and, uh, and potential difference. So it w EMF is, in the context of circuits anyway, um, potential difference in EMF for a properly functioning battery, those two are essentially indistinguishable. So I'm going to kind of wander back and forth. Sometimes I'll call it EMF. Sometimes I'll call it potential difference. Partly it depends on my mood. Sometimes it depends on specifically what I'm doing. If the difference is ever actually crucial, I will make sure that, that it's clear. But if I, if I just say EMF or I just say potential difference and I don't make any comment about it, then you can choose whichever one you like. And it, doesn't, it won't make any, it, it, and I don't make a distinction between them because it doesn't matter. You'll get the same numbers no matter what you do, you know, whichever choice you make. So uh, uh, I'm tempted to use just V here simply because it's slightly more familiar. But probably I should call it EMF, whatever. It doesn't matter. OK, so there's a potential difference. And remember that the potential difference is related to the electric field. E is equal to minus delta V over delta, uh, delta X. So this is the uh, so this is potential difference. The wire's length is L. So the electric field in this case is equal to negative the potential difference divided by the length of the wire over which we've applied that potential difference. So there's that. So the, the point that I want to get to is that these charges moving as, I, as they are from left to right uh, are uh, doing so. They have kinetic energy because they're moving. They have potential energy because there's a potential difference happening, right? Uh, and uh, occasionally, and more than occasionally, these charges uh, will, you know, normal uh, charge transfer is to hop from atom to atom to atom to atom, but occasionally uh, it, they miss and they collide with the atom, but don't, the, the, these charges, these mobile charge carriers collide with an atom, but don't actually attach to it, they, rather they bounce off. Well, that's an inelastic collision. And you might remember from your first quarter uh, of physics, that in an inelastic collision, energy is not conserved. Kinetic energy is lost. Well, it, energy is not really lost. In this case, it's transformed into thermal energy, which causes the other atoms, specifically the ones that it crashed into without binding to it, without bonding to it, it, uh, it increased the kinetic energy of the, uh, of the atom that it bounced off of. Okay, remember I said thermal energy is represented on, or is, uh, um, Uh, sorry, thermal energy is represented on the, on the microscopic level as increased movement of the uh, particles that make up your wire. So in short, uh, as these charge carriers occasionally bounce into and then bounce off of atoms that make up this copper wire, uh, there's some loss of kinetic energy which transformed to thermal energy, and so the wire is getting hotter. Okay? And the bigger the potential difference you apply, the more rapidly that happens. Okay? So a big battery with a big potential difference, it's going to try to drive a big current, which is fine, it will, but it's also going to increase uh, the number and the frequency of these collisions. Therefore, it's going to increase the amount of energy that gets transferred from the motion of the charge carriers 
to thermal energy of the wire, and that's why the wire gets hot. And once, the, and then, but it's kind of a self-feeding uh, system because as the, once the wire gets hotter, the the, uh, the atoms that make up the wire are moving more and more rapidly, and so the, the possibilities, the probabilities of collisions between the charge carriers and the now more and more agitated atoms, the, the probability of collisions increases significantly. And so you, the amount of thermal energy transferred increases significantly, which makes the thing hotter, which makes more collisions, which makes more energy transfer, which makes it hotter, and so you get this, this vicious circle, this uh, feedback loop, and before you know it, your wire is getting really, really hot. Okay, so that's where the temperature comes in, and that's why resistance uh, changes with changing temperature. And when that's true, as I say, Ohm's law fails. Okay, and in fact, uh, there are materials, and I mentioned one a, a few lectures ago. There are materials that are designed uh, to uh, have a lot of these collisions, or to put it more simply, there are materials that are designed to have their temperature increase when you try to force a large current through them. And the example that I have in mind here is the, I mentioned a few lectures ago, nichrome, the wire that they use to make the uh, toaster elements, those wires that get orange hot, there's a reason they get orange hot. This is the reason they get orange hot. You plug that toaster into your wall outlet, it's a huge potential difference, 120 volts, it's therefore trying to drive a huge current through your, the, the, uh, the, the toaster elements of your, of your toaster. Those things are designed with a comparatively high resistance to flow, and so a lot of energy transfer, those wires get really hot, they get so hot they actually glow. They give, they're giving off, they get so much thermal energy that some of that thermal energy gets converted to light energy. That's the orange glow that you see, okay? Plus a huge amount of heat energy, that's what cooks your toast. Toast your bread. Uh, and, and nichrome, as one example, is a material that's designed to have a huge resistance and a huge change of resistance with temperature. As such, nichrome is one example of a class of materials that are called non-ohmic materials. What does this say? The resistance is a, actually a function of temperature, T, capital T temperature. Okay, so as the temperature changes, the resistance changes. Uh, specifically, as the temperature increases, the resistance increases, but when the resistance increases, the temperature increases again, which increases the resistance, which increases the, the rate at which the temperature increases. And so, <clears throat> for those of you who love this sort of thing, you end up with what's known as a differential equation. Okay? Um, we're not going to worry about differential equations here, but I just want to let you know. Okay, so uh, these materials are, as I say, are called non-ohmic. And that simply is a phrase of art uh, to tell you that nichrome does not obey Ohm's law. Nichrome does, this equation does not work for nichrome as one example. Okay. Also, in, the old style light bulbs, incandescent light bulbs, the, the, uh, the, uh, they work by having a thin piece of wire inside a glass uh, globe. Uh, and that thin piece of wire, we force a huge amount of current through it so much current that the uh, wire gets so hot that it actually glows not orange hot, but it glows white hot. That's the white light coming out of an incandescent bulb, and, but a lot of heat too. And if you've ever touched an a incandescent light bulb, that while it's still on, you probably burned your fingers. That's how much temperature those things put out, how much heat energy they put out. So anyway, so that's non-ohmic. Now, um, the... Uh, Relationship is pretty easy, and I'll just go ahead and do this. Probably I should do this in another lecture, but actually five more minutes and I'm done, less. Okay, so now we can actually, let's actually calculate uh, how much energy gets put out, okay, by this uh, whole operation. Because after all, the wire, as it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, it's giving off 
light energy, it's giving off heat energy. Those are the that's like 99% of the uh, energy that it emits. But it's it's emitting energy uh, some some number of joules every second. Right? As long as you continue forcing a current through it, the energy uh, that's being spewed out, being lost by the hot hot wire in the form of as I say primarily light and heat, uh, it's losing lots of joules of energy every second the circuit is operating. And uh, we can talk about that. Uh, we call that power, symbol capital P. Capital, the power is simply the rate at which uh, energy, and I will call it, I'll call that energy W here. Um, no, I won't. I'm sorry. Let me call that, uh, let me call it, um, There's no good symbol here. Um, yeah, this isn't perfect. I don't love this. <clears throat> I was going to call it delta W because I'm thinking about work, but I know that I'm about to. I know what the units are going to be, the units of power, and so I didn't want to use work, as you'll see in a moment. Um, I don't want to use. I, then I should call it delta E for, but for energy. But I'm using E over here for electric field, so that's confusing. Uh, so I'll call it delta U. I don't like delta U either because delta U makes you think of only potential energy, but this is actually light energy plus heat energy. It's not potential energy in the normal sense, but it's the best I can do. So anyway, we'll just call it that. Uh, the, so this is power. The, basically, the energy that's lost by the circuit due, because of the resistance, it's lost in the form of light and heat, lost to the circuit, lost to the battery. And the units of this thing are, of course, joules per second. And joules per second has been defined. And now you'll see why I didn't want to use work on this. The uh, joule per second has been defined as the watt. and its symbol is capital W. A watt is a joule per second. It's named after the American inventor and engineer, uh, James Watt, and who improved steam engines, and so power, you know, so energy uh, output per second. Uh, yeah, so um, that's what that is. Now, the relationship of power to the uh, potential supplied by the battery and the uh, current that flows through the battery uh, that relationship is easy, and it's simply, and I'm just going to hand you this result. I've sort of hand waved my way around it being plausible, but I didn't actually prove it, but I'm not going to bother proving it. I'll simply hand it to you. ICBS, it can be shown that the power, the, that is to say the number of joules that's lost to the circuit every second, uh, is can be calculated by the potential difference supplied by the battery multiplied by the current that flows through the battery as a result of that potential difference. Okay, and so evidently a watt is also a volt times an amp. So a watt is a joule per second. It's also a volt times an amp. Uh, now, this is the correct relationship. This is the general relationship. This will hold true for any circuit with any amount of resistance, no matter what the resistance is doing, and in particular, even if the resistance is a function of time. Because if the resistance is a function of time, then the current is a function of time as well. And so the, uh, so the power will be a function of time as well. But that's all right. This relationship holds. Now. In the special case that the material in question is ohmic, or the circuit as a whole is ohmic, and this simply means that the calculation 
of the current is simply the potential difference applied by the battery divided by the resistance of the battery. If this is correct, if this relationship is correct for our given circuit, then since I is equal to V divided by R, uh, I can solve this for V. Uh, V is equal to I times R, and then I substitute that in, and I can get that P can also be calculated as I squared times R. And that's occasionally useful if you happen to know what current you're flowing through the uh, circuit, which you typically do. I mean, that's easy to measure with a meter. Resistance is easy to measure with a meter, so you can just sort of plug these in and get power. Um, but this is pretty easy to measure, too. So this, but so this is true only if your circuit is ohmic, only if it obeys Ohm's law. If it, but this is true whether uh, the um, circuit obeys Ohm's law or not. Okay, and so uh, so a uh, three volt battery uh, with uh, what did we do before? We had a ten amp circuit. Okay, and so this would be uh, thirty uh, volts times amps which is 30 watts, which is 30 joules per second. Okay. Uh, and on the other hand, for the same example that we did before, uh, so this is P, I could do, we, we decided that the current that we got was 10 amps. That was in the earlier example of the light bulb. Uh, so I have a 10 amp squared and the resistance we decided was 0 0.3 ohms, if I recall correctly. And so this is 100 amps squared times 0 0.3 ohms. And that gives us, uh, yeah, sure enough, 30 amp squared ohms, which is evidently 30 watts also. So as you see, we get the same answer, but we got the same answer only by assuming that the material that made up our light bulb was, in fact, ohmic, and that may or may not be true. Okay, so that's uh, this, by the way, this expression here. This is called the Joule heating law. named after the French-American physicist, uh, Augustine Joule. Uh, same, same guy for the units of energy, by the way, Joule. All right, good enough. What do we do now? I don't know, Let's, maybe we stick a capacitor in there. See what happens.